This will be a talk of, uh, I guess, two hours uh, with some breaks in between. But uh, uh, I never use clickers, and uh, uh, I don't know how to use the clickers. And uh, since I only finished preparing this on the plane last night from Japan, I didn't get a chance to practice using clickers on the plane. So you'll have to excuse me if you're expecting to use clickers. But uh, in place of clickers, feel free to uh, interrupt me at any time for clarification or questions that you have. Sorry, that you have during my lecture. You just raise your hand, I'll stop speaking and uh, answer the question. So, uh, I'll be talking, as Gary mentioned, uh, about the what we call third generation solar photon conversion, both to electricity, which is mainly solid state physics, and to fuels, which involves uh, chemistry. And there are lots of people here listed who are the major uh, contributors to this work. Um, in particular, Matt Beard, Joey Luther, and Justin Johnson are regular NREL staff. Uh, their pictures are shown here. This is Matt Beard, Joey Luther, and Justin Johnson. They'll also be giving talks at this meeting later later this week and next week uh, during the uh, workshop. The others on the list are graduate students and postdocs. Uh, graduate students are mainly from the University of Colorado, but they're also some from uh, Colorado School of Mines. So this is kind of an outline of the talk uh, or the lectures. Not necessarily in uh, chronological order, but the topics that we uh, covered that are listed here. And I'll be starting with a background in history. How did we come to the notion of this third generation? What is it? What's involved? Um, what's behind it? And these are some of the details that form this uh, background and historical part of the uh, presentation. And then I'll talk uh, about more recent work that's actually started in, in uh, the 90s, so it's, it's not that recent, but it's the one that we focused on at NREL that is receiving a lot of attention uh, globally because it looks promising and uh, very interesting. And I'll end with a uh, molecular system that uh, exhibits the same features of these semiconductors when they're in the quantum regime and being able to generate, for example, more than one electron hole pair per photon. So the first thing I'd like to do is just define what we mean by the third or the next or the future. Some people who are in the photovoltaics uh, industry and uh, technology object to the use of the term third generation because it implies the first two generations, which are what exist today, uh, like single crystal silicon, polycrystal silicon, thin film silicon. Silicon is 93% of the commercial market. And the new uh, technologies based on thin films, uh, which are compound semiconductors like cadmium telluride and copper and uh, gallium selenide, our second generation, and uh, as far as third generation, there's, there's nothing, no uh, approaches based on this idea of the third generation that actually are commercialized. So they're uh, laboratory, uh, they're in the laboratory stage in the early stages of development, but because it's called third generation, the complaint from the, from the first and second generation people is that uh, their uh, degree of support from investors, uh, venture capitalists, and the government support of you know, different countries around the world is uh, decreasing because they think erroneously that the third generation is already here and, and uh, therefore it's 
better to invest and support the third generation for the near term, but it's, it's not a near term. Um, it's, not, it's not going to be happen in the near term. It's a longer term process, but has the uh, potential of having a big impact on um, making solar technology cheaper and hence more prevalent. So the two criteria for the calling something third, next, or future is that it would have a high efficiency greater than this number that you probably may have already heard, which is called the Shakti Kwisar limit, 32% calculated by Shakti Kwisar in 1961, uh, based on certain assumptions that are not, uh, they're not laws, they're just assumptions which can be bypassed in the third generation approach. But in addition to high efficiency, you need low costs, very low costs in terms of the initial capital investment. I mean, the energy after you install your converter and module system is free, but the, you have to pay a significant amount of money up front, and so that's the aerial cost dollars per square meter. And uh, it's our belief, at least in the work on the third generation, that the combination of high efficiency cost, which is easily calculated from those two numbers, uh, to produce the cost of energy in kilowatt hours, say of either electricity or fuel jewels, uh, has to be lower than the cost of coal and natural gas, because these costs are uh, quite low, especially natural gas is about one-sixth the cost of what it was just five or six years ago. Okay, now um, there are many approaches uh, that I'll briefly discuss, but we'll be focused on nanoscience and nanostructures as the root to the third generation. So, as I mentioned, uh, many of these topics will you know, be discussed in approximately this order. So I'll get started. Um, so in terms of the history, uh, the history of uh, what we call third generation really started in the uh, late 70s. Most of you weren't born at that time, but uh, maybe your parents remember there was a big ener a global energy crisis in the 70s where the price of uh, fossil fuel doubled or tripled in a very short time due to, a, to the uh, oil embargo in the Middle East. And that kind of, well, that kicked off a, a major effort globally to uh, investigate alternative sources of energy. And uh, this is when uh, our institute in Golden, called Embrel, but then it was called Solar Energy Research Institute, was founded in 1977 by President Carter to address this uh, global uh, energy crisis of the mid 70s. Um, so I joined uh, Sari in 1978 and uh, had already worked on a field called photoelectrochemistry, which is, and you heard John Turner's talk about water splitting. This is where photoelectrochemistry started in terms of applications to energy. It's a, it's a much older science field. It was developed by Professor Heinz Gerischer in Germany in the 60s, uh, but it was just based it was just a study of the basic science of semiconductor liquid interfaces and junctions formed between semiconductors and liquids and under illumination how charges get separated. But these charges in, in the early days were aimed at doing redox chemistry, oxidation and reduction of water to produce hydrogen and oxygen, which is essentially what we water stream. Um, and uh, even then, we were thinking, as uh, this new institute was formed, of how to improve the efficiency of this process. And in this uh, idea of using the hot carriers, and I'll explain later what is meant by a hot carrier and why that affects the efficiency when you're able to use hot carriers as opposed to using relaxed carriers, or thermalized carriers, or sometimes called cold carriers which have an energy that's uh, coincident with the electron temp temperature of these 
carriers, but carriers are just electrons and holes, charge carriers, uh, equal to the lattice temperature. So this was uh, this idea of being able to extract the electrons produced by absorption of high-energy photons bigger than the band gap of the semiconductor and inject them into a liquid to drive these uh, fuel-producing reactions uh, goes back to 78, so it's, it's quite an old concept. And then in, uh, a few years later, um, we had experimental evidence that we could inject hot electrons into a liquid. And that was the first time that the idea that uh, this would be possible because of quantization to slow down the electron cooling process. The reason uh, why hot carriers were not considered to be important in uh, solar energy devices was that the process of the electrons interacting with phonons to produce excited vibrational states in the semiconductor, which produce heat, and is thus not available for conversion into free energy. This process is very fast. It's a picosecond or less. And that was one of the major assumptions of the shock decrease our analysis, was that the hot carriers were not available for useful work in any photovoltaic device and in any fuel producing device. Uh, I would add that uh, solar cells in, in, uh, before uh, the 70s was primarily essentially all concerned with photovoltaics. But in 1972, there was a famous paper by Fujishima and Honda in Nature showing that you could use a semiconductor, albeit it was a large band gap semiconductor, namely titanium dioxide, which does, has a band gap of three electron volts, therefore it doesn't absorb much sunlight, uh, and it's not efficient, could um, absorb light, produce electrons and holes, but instead of, in that case, extracting the electrons and holes as an electrical current to produce electrical power, it was used to drive chemical reactions uphill, like water splitting. So, um, so that's, uh, as I said, was, we tried to improve the efficiency of water splitting by um, using these hot carriers, and quantization was invoked in, way back in 1980, but it was quantization in the space charge region, which is the region of the semiconductor where the electric field is produced when it equilibrates with the second phase. So when the Fermi levels equilibrate between two phases, this is a general rule of interfacial photophysics, or, physics, or interfacial physics, that um, you produce a double layer of charge whenever the Fermi levels are different between the two phases because the Fermi levels will equilibrate. That equilibration results in uh, charge transfer to produce a double layer of producing an electric field. And it's uh, called the space charge because the electric field is extended over a finite space. And then uh, a few years after that, we showed that uh, if you could use the hot carriers, this would produce a much higher efficiency than was calculated by Shockley and Cuisart. So you would go from 32% to 66%. And it was shown that this is equivalent to the efficiency you would achieve if you used uh, many layers of semiconductors in a tandem solar cell um, such that in the limit, when, when uh, you have a band gap in the, in the tandem structure that matches every photon energy in the solar spectrum, you would get the same efficiency of 66, 68%. These efficiency numbers, the Shockley value varies between 31 and 33%, depending on the specific uh, standard solar spectrum you use. It's generally 1.5 spectrum, which means this is when the sun is at an angle with respect to the perpendicular direction, such that you pass light to one and a half atmospheres, so that's why it's called 1.5 um, Okay, so um, this 
really was the birth of this idea of the future generation. Because all solar cells in those days, and even today, operate um, with the production of only one electron volt pair per absorbed photon. And the hot, uh, the, uh, the hot electron, the, the hot carriers uh, can't produce more than one, but the other way to use the hot carriers, and this is what was done initially, it's very difficult, is to try to extract them and inject them into the solution before they thermalize. So that means they have to be transported to the interface, they have to cross the interface to do electron transfer, redox chemistry, um, and prevent the back reaction all before they cool. So that process is, is a very difficult, but if it, another process is to use the hot electrons and holes, there's always a hole created when you absorb a photon. But you can just talk about one of the carriers to simplify the discussion. Uh, you could use that excess energy, energy to generate more than one electron, instead of get, and that would give you more current. The first process of extracting it at the initial energy at which it was, it was created would produce a higher voltage. But whether you produce a higher voltage or a higher current, you still get a higher efficiency since the power of the product is the two. Um, so we, in uh, the mid-80s, we actually built some uh, solar cells in which we uh, used quantization, not in the space charge layer, but deliberately produced in a, a nanostructure. The first nanostructure that was um, uh, discovered and investigated was quantum confinement in one dimension. So these were like thin films which are sufficiently thin to produce quantum effects but in, only in the z direction, the xy direction was uh, macroscopic. So these were called in those days quantum wells or super biases. And the problem was that you could only slow down the cooling the idea that you could slow down the cooling had to do with the fact that when you have quantization, you would have discrete states instead of in a bulk material, you've got a quasi-continuum. So the electrons can cool by emitting one phonon in a sequence, one at a time. But when you have discrete states, and the spacing is more than the energy of a single electron-phonon interaction, you need many phonons to interact with one electron. So that makes the process improbable. So that idea was uh, explored, but it was found that you, you would need very high light intensity in order to achieve that slow cooling. And that led to the idea of having three-dimensional confinement, which is a nanocrystal, either a quantum dot or a quantum rod, um, because in that case, you don't have, uh, you don't need the high intensity to get the slow cooling. And so that, that's something that uh, is now currently being investigated and it works. And um, this led to the idea that you could generate more than one electron whole pair in quantum dots, they're called excitons, which are electron whole pairs in which the electrons and holes are coupled by Coulomb attraction to produce um, what's called an exciton. So it's an exciting state of the system in which the electron and pole are correlated. So we call it multiple exciton generation, or MEG. And then finally, uh, we showed uh, in work at from Hendrell, just published in Science in December, that uh, the MEG could be observed in the photocurrent. Prior to that, it was only observed spectroscopically, which is an indirect method. And uh, the, the quantum efficiency is greater than 100% based on the external input flux of photons um, divided into the number of electrons you collect. So you collect uh, more than 100% of the um, photons entering the cell, showing that you're getting a multiplication. Okay, so quantization, as you know from your elementary quantum mechanics, occurs when you take the a bulk semiconductor and you reduce the size to less than 30 nanometers, the size that of which you get the discrete states. In this condition, you can't, you know, it's shown in bands 
that our the spacing of the levels is so dense that it's considered like a continuum. And in the quantum well, when the size is sufficiently small, and that size depends on the Bohr radius of the semiconductor or the effective mass when it's very effective mass is small, the Bohr radius is big. So if you make the particle smaller than the, twice the Bohr radius, you get discrete states, just like in a molecule. And as I say, the, um, uh, this quantization leads to very interesting properties that are not present in the bulk. And you can see that uh, as you make the particle smaller and smaller, you get a larger and larger blue shift due to the quantum confinement effect as comes uh, out easily from the expressions of uh, describing the energy levels in a uh, quantum confined structure. And these dots can be produced through uh, colloidal chemistry at room temperature. And this is where the possibility comes in that the solar cells producing these could be made cheaper because most solar cells are made with high temperature processing. And with the quantum dots and other nanocrystals, which can be produced at much lower temperature, produced in solution as colloidal inks, and then sprayed or uh, produce a full cold processing just like photographic film or plastic sheet could pr produce very low cost solar cells. And this is a famous picture just showing one material uh, with different sizes showing this uh, big blue shift as you make the size small. And you can span the whole range from the um, ultraviolet or into the infrared on the side. So this is a very interesting and useful <coughs> great demonstration of quantum mechanics and it has many applications other than photovoltaics because it can be used for uh, light emitting diodes and uh, other optoelectronic devices. Okay, so the idea as I mentioned was that uh, this multiplication which is actually known in the bulk semiconductor, has been known for many years, uh, always had uh, been found to occur far outside the solar spectrum in the ultraviolet region. And uh, I'll explain why that is, but our, our uh, prediction in uh, 1990 or so was that in the quantum dot, the process should be efficient even in the visible. And it's because you can slow down the cooling because of this discreteness of the electronic states. And you enhance the fundamental process of the multiplication, which is an Auger type process, which involves multiple excitons. And it depends on Coulomb coupling. So when you squeeze the electrons and moles together in a small region of space, you enhance Coulomb coupling, which enhances um, the MEG process. And the MEG process is the inverse of the normal OJ, which is when two, two electron hole pairs exist, say in the ground hole state, ground state, one can recombine and give its energy to one of the remaining particles and excite it to a higher state. And that's just the inverse of MEG, where you start with the highest uh, energy state of the electron and produce two electrons by this uh, process. Now in bulk materials, it's called impact ionization. It's been known for 40 years, but it's, it's not useful for solar because of that requirement of high energy photons. Whereas in um, quantum dots, it, it can occur in the visible region, be useful for solar applications. And we call it multiple exon generation because, as I mentioned, the electrons and holes are correlated. So uh, this just to go quickly through some of the um, in the background again. I explained the words, but these will be diagrams. The photoelectrochemistry depends on the junction between the semiconductor and the electrolyte that produces a space charge. This is going to be a small region which varies from 100 angstroms to 10 angstroms, depends on the doping density of the semiconductor. And under illumination, these electrons and holes will separate in this, um, driven by the space charge, they can be absorbed and be created in the flat band region and 
used for this region, but uh, you need generally need a uh, field to get a, a big uh, effect of charge separation, um, except in some devices which, like again, in photovoltaics, there is no band bending, so you depend on um, differences in chemical potential to drive the carriers through the interface, and then there's a band offset. You know, Gary Young, we've got like that model, we've got a different model, and I think he's giving a talk to explain it. But in any case, with semiconductors in the bulk, this is what is uh, behind the efficient charge separation. And the first uh, application that I mentioned in the 70s was to use this uh, semiconductor, the bands are bent up because it's n type. If, if it's p type, the bands bend down and the electrons are injected into the solution. But when it's n-type, holes are injected. These holes are oxidizing agents. And you can see that the oxidation potential is, is, is used. For titanium dioxide, it's 2.2 volts, which is uh, greater than it, uh, the oxidation potential required to oxidize any compound uh, on Earth, including uh, uh, fluoride ion and uh, very strongly uh, oxidizing materials can, can be oxidized themselves with these holes. And so it can be used for pollution control, which is a general process. That's very big in Japan. It's not just in Japan. It's, they're coating most of Japan with titanium dioxide to uh, clean up the pollutants. Um, okay, now, in addition to in addition to producing fuel, say by water splitting, you can use the semiconductor liquid junction to produce electricity in a photoelectrochemical solar cell, photovoltaic cell. If you just have one couple in here, which is which dominates the electrochemistry, so whatever gets oxidized by the hole, when you when the electron comes around, does work electrical work and is injected back in, it reduces what's been oxidized in this electrode at the anode, reduce it back to its original starting condition. So there's no free energy change in here. And this is the basis of uh, electrochemical photovoltaic cells, which are quite efficient, but uh, all of these systems suffer from corrosion, because this hole being so strongly oxidized, it can oxidize the semiconductor instead of oxidizing what you want it to do, which is uh, oxidize some redox species in solution. And then finally, you can also configure uh, these semiconductor liquid interfaces by interposing a dye in between the liquid electrolyte and the semiconductor. And I frankly talk on this. These are called dye sensitive dye solar cells, where you don't absorb the light in this large fan gap semiconductor. And most of the light you absorb it in the lower fan gap or homo molecule. Uh, and you can tune it to whatever you want by choosing the right molecule, and then you get charge projection at the interface at this uh, excited stage, it's higher than conduction band. And then you uh, have a relay in here, which is uh, currently iodine, iodine, which transfers the whole to the other electrode to become reduced and close the circuit. And so that's called the Gressel cell, because Gressel is the first used nanocrystal and titanium dioxide for this process. The idea of using dyes to sensitize semiconductors is also very well known that all the early work was based on single crystals. So you just have a monolayer. But here you have nanocrystals of titanium dioxide, which have a huge surface area. So a single monolayer around each particle, uh, when you have 30 or 40 layers of these particles, gives you more, you have 30 microns thickness gives you a, a ability to absorb all the photons. So in 78, as I mentioned, the uh, first idea was uh, presented that you could use hot carriers to enhance the efficiency. And this is where the quantization was invoked in the space chart, because when you uh, have the you know, carriers confined in the interface of a small region of space, you also produce quantization. 
And uh, that was used to explain how we were able to inject hot electrons. Normally, when the electrons uh, are not hot, they just follow the band edge and are injected at this energy. But we found through experimental work done with John Turner uh, back in the 80s, early 80s, that we could inject into the solution before you get complete relaxation of the electron. And that's just shown here um, in the old theory of how this actually works. Okay, now uh, we, I'll just switch to this uh, thermodynamics of general idea of being able to um, determine how much, uh, what the efficiency is, how much useful work you get out of a certain amount of incoming radiation. And in the shockley quasar analysis, you assume that the only loss um, of the uh, system is emitted radiation and the heat loss due to the cooling of the hot electrons. Okay, how, okay, how are we going to work this? For a break? Yeah. For a break? Right? No, wait a second. We started at 1 o'clock. So we got we 35 minutes. Yeah, so your total lecture is 45 minutes, 15 minute breaks. Okay, but there's a 15-minute discussion here. Yeah. So but that's the formal discussion. <laughs> but we're skipping the discussion using clickers. <laughs> <laughs> so that should uh, enable more time, I would think. Because the time it will cut, cut into the break. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to speed up. I thought we would have more. Okay, so this is the shock increase our analysis. The electrons relax, you only have one electron per photon, you don't absorb any photons less than the gamma. Recombination, radiated recombination, the only loss mechanism, and you relax the hot carriers to the band edge. And that's shown here. Subgap photons aren't absorbed. The big photons lose their energy by cooling. There's some loss when you uh, cross this uh, space charge, and the voltage you get is much less than the band gap. And uh, you always get less than the band gap in terms of the photo voltage, except when you go to very small band gaps, because um, as you increase the intensity of both band gap, the voltage approaches the band gap. But if you have normal semiconductors greater than, say, 0.4 volts, uh, you, you lose generally about three tenths of a volt in, from the band gap in the photo voltage. And that's the quasi, uh, the shock of quasar analysis giving you 32%. So in a conventional cell where you allow this relaxation to occur, you only get 32% efficiency. And then you could plot the efficiency versus the band gap. And you've probably seen this, you get sort of a, a peak region which has got us uh, bracketed by silicon and gallium arsenide uh, between 1.1 and 1.4 electron volts where you get the maximum efficiency. And as I mentioned, there's some variation in what the maximum efficiency is depending upon what you choose for the standard solar spectrum. And if you collected all the photons in the solar spectrum, you'd get 70 milliamps per square second. Now, how do you break it? Shock the Quasar limit, and why do you want to break it? So these are the first two generations that I talked about, which produce electricity. Well, currently, uh, the cost has actually gone down by quite a bit because of uh, the activity in China producing very low cost solar modules. Um, but uh, five years ago, this is the cost was the cost of silicon. Now it's about a dollar fifty or two dollars per peak watt, and you got double it because of the cost of everything but the module. So the you know, five years ago, the cost of the silicon elect the electricity produced by silicon was about seven dollars total, which is about thirty cents per kilowatt hour. But now the DOE is aiming for uh, producing electricity at ten cents per kilowatt hour, which is the cost of conventional power uh, from the grid using fossil fuels. 
And both of these technologies have improved such that uh, they're down to about a dollar per watt. It's, it's the goal uh, now for the DOE in 2020, that would produce 10 cents. But as I mentioned, in order to compete with coal, which is two to three cents per kilowatt hour, you would need to be in this region. So that's the third generation having an efficiency greater than, say, 50 percent, coupled with a low cost of $110 a square meter. And there's many ways to do this. There's a couple of books by uh, Martin Green and Antonio Luca, which uh, discuss all the different ways to beat the shock request our limit. And you can beat it with the tandem solar cell. I think you heard a talk on tandem cells with efficiencies greater than 32 percent, but they don't it costs tens of, many tens of thousands of dollars per square meter and are used only in space, not on Earth. So this is the process I discussed, and um, this is uh, how it works. If you have, if you start at time zero, you pump the, so you just got a distribution of electron energies, that's just the Boltzmann distribution of reflecting hydrogen room temperature. And now you excite with a high energy photon. The first thing that happens, you scatter the hot electrons with the cold electrons and begin to get a Boltzmann distribution that reflects the addition of hot electrons. So this is the hot electron temperature calculated from the slope of this line, fitting this to the uh, Boltzmann distribution. And that gives you a very high electron temperature, which then cools as it this phone on and eventually you get back to the original um, condition um, where, where you started. But in the meantime, you would have a electron temperature with just more electron holes present before you undergo um, complete recombination of the electron, the photo generated electrons and holes. And so you can beat that with using multi gap semiconductors, very expensive. So it's not yet in third generation. And this is what we're going to be using in our approach. Use the excess kinetic energy to um, create either higher voltage for the hot carry process or multiply the photons, giving more electrons per photon. And this one, I won't talk at all about it. There might be a talk here. But it's a way to produce a state in the middle of the gap or in the gap such that you can absorb the red photons, the infrared photons, and then pump them in a second stage up to the conduction layer. And therefore, you would uh, be able to use uh, the low energy photons. And uh, this is the general idea. You can either do this with a sequence of different band gaps of the multi junction tandem cells, or you could split the spectrum using actually selective mirrors that will reflect only certain regions of the solar spectrum and then have independent absorbers which are matched to those wavelengths. And uh, there was a talk, I think, yet showing how you get these uh, high efficiencies with these multi junctions, but they're very expensive, so they're still they're not yet in the third generation. And this is a, these are some of the examples of uh, there are three junction and four junction solar cells that produce quite good uh, efficiencies, especially when you concentrate. Now there's a diminishing return. If you use four, you, you, uh, and you're at one sun, you, you can get almost 50%. But you can go higher, but you can see you have diminishing return after four or five junctions. So most of the work today is, is at most five junctions. It doesn't really pay to go more than five because you don't gain that much more. But you do gain by going to high concentration. And I'll show later that high concentration also improves the efficiency of MEG when it's coupled to the concentration. This is the intermediate band where you put in a band and you do it with panel structures and that's conformance. And you get, pick up those low energy protons. Um, you can also down convert or up convert the light before it reaches the solar cell. So in this case, uh, uh, this is like MEG, but you do it with the photons instead of with the electron. So you can produce two photons from um, uh, of lower energy 
and therefore create two electron hole pairs from low energy region in the solar spectrum. We can take um, two photons and up convert and, and uh, get a higher voltage with the red photons. So we're close to the images. We'll give you guys a little break in a minute. But, um, as I mentioned, you can extract the hot electrons, give you a higher voltage, and you can even do it before if there's any thermalization. Uh, type 1, where you allow cooling in the flat band region, but uh, extract them as hot electrons before they cross the space channel. And that's the paper, and this is the calculation showing that if you allow the temperature of the electrons to remain at the temperature which they're created, which is about 3,000 degrees, when you have a flat plate collector on the Earth, on the surface of the Earth, and are able to use it all without any loss, you can double the efficiency. But if, you, if there is some loss, and there is some heat loss, and cooling, you get, well, you get, you get an increase in the smaller degree of enhancement, but always significantly greater than allowing full relaxation and cooling of the electrons. So, as I mentioned, the hot electrons give you a higher voltage, the carrier multiplication gives you a higher current, you can collect the hot electrons in a solar cell. This has been done uh, by the group in Australia. Instead of doing electrochemistry, if you have a low work function contract, you can collect them. And so this is still, this idea of using hot electrons is still being pursued. We're not doing it at the end of I mentioned this part before. So I think we'll stop here because I'm going to not talk about the use of quantum confinement to enhance the efficiency of the solar cells. So I don't know if we take any questions, we just have a break. Let's do a few quick questions. I'm sure there's lots of questions. Right here. Uh, so in the, in the efficiency versus cost plot, what is the BOS? Oh, that balance of system. So that's the cost of everything but the photoactive region. So that's the steel, you know, the structure that holds the module together, the tax, and the cost of land, the cost of cleaning. All the other costs uh, contribute to significant. The, convert, the inverter, the convert the DC to the AC. These are all called balance of system costs. And that's about twice. It's about equal to the so to the module cost. Yeah, yeah. I may have missed this, but how much voltage do you require to do an electrode? How much voltage? For the side carrier to be able to do electrochemistry, how much of an energy do you require? Well, well, you have to satisfy energy conservation, so you need at least twice the gap because the so you got a gap and you got a photon that's bigger than the gap. So in order to excite a second electron across this gap, the, the extra energy you have in the electron that you created with the photon has to be equal to the gap, so that's twice the gap. It, is it twice or something more than twice? Well, if you had, in the ideal case, there's no, you can do it with no loss and it would be exactly twice. What happens in a molecule with single division is exactly twice because you excite the first excited state and that's exactly just a little bit less than uh, twice the bandwidth. It's very close to two. And in some of the semiconductor now it's getting close to two. And I didn't get the chance to talk about it, but in bulk you have to satisfy the momentum, not just energy, like we do in classical physics. And the momentum requires a bigger photon because the band structure you have to sense. Also, if you have an indirect band capsule, you have to sense. Well, the indirect still has a threshold of two. It's just that it's a weak absorption. The last burning question. Um, yeah, when you're calculating the cost of solar energy and you want it to be 10 cents per kilowatt hour, like, um, when you take into account that it's cheaper and cheaper as you average out, like if you have it like one percent a year, is it isn't that cheaper to take off after two years? Um, 
Well, the cost when the modules are rated at dollars per peak watt, which is how much uh, how much does it uh, cost to get a watt of energy when the sun is at high noon with no clouds? Doesn't it cost zero once you pay for the Yeah, but um, you, money isn't free, so you borrow the money to put in the system, then you got to pay it off with interest over time. So it's the cost of money that gets cranked into the cost of converting okay. the investment into energy cost. We, we actually learned a week ago that uh, mowing the grass under the panels is a big, big cost. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a major, major cost to so it's going to be a big convenience for uh, Anyway, let's, uh, let's take 10 minutes and uh, we restart at 2.